I'm Dr. Gary Felder. I got my PhD in physics at Stanford University under Andre Linde, and now I'm a professor at Smith College. I study inflationary cosmology, and I've taught the math methods course a number of times, as well as many other courses in the curriculum. And I'm Kenny Felder, and I'm his brother. And you have to say more than that. I'm his older brother. And? I, um, I got my physics degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and for the past 15 years, I've been a math teacher at Raleigh Charter High School. I've taught most of the lower level topics in our book, such as differential equations, Taylor series, partial derivatives, multiple integrals, vector calculus, and some linear algebra. When I first started teaching math methods, I looked at a lot of textbooks that were available, and there were things I liked about a lot of them but none of them connected the math to the physics and the engineering enough. When students learn a math topic without understanding the application, they're much more likely to forget it. And two years later, their quantum mechanics professor says, what do you mean you don't know Fourier transforms? Didn't you take math methods? So, so Gary comes to me and he says, I'm gonna be writing a math methods textbook. And I meant to say something like, I think my experience teaching these advanced topics to very advanced high school students might come in very useful here. But it actually came out more like, cool, can I help? And Gary said, sure. And that moment changed the next three or four years of my life. The math methods course that I teach at Smith is required for both physics and engineering students. So I've always thought of this as the same body of material with multiple audiences. We took an early draft of one of the first chapters and we showed it to our father, Dr. Richard Felder. He's a professor of chemical engineering and a textbook author. And he confirmed, yeah, this is exactly the same material that engineering students need to learn, but the examples need to be more tailored to specific engineering disciplines. So we talked to a lot of engineers, mechanical, electrical, en environmental engineers, biomedical engineers, and many of them generously donated a lot of their time to give us examples, read through them, make sure we got them right, and help us tailor the book more to a variety of those fields. So what you find when you look in the book, in the explanations, in the problems, you find specific examples drawn from these different disciplines. But a lot of the chapters will also end with what we call a special application section, highlighting a particular use. For instance, lots of different engineering disciplines use complex numbers, but electrical engineers use them in a very specific way. When you analyze a circuit using complex impedance, it's totally different from analyzing that circuit and insisting on all real numbers. So we wrote a special section that most users will probably ignore, but electrical engineering professors might find particularly useful in the complex numbers chapter. Electrical engineers also use J for the imaginary number. Yeah, we don't do that. Sorry. One of my favorite features of the textbook is what we call an exercise. It's a coherent block of problems that walks the student through a particular mathematical process. There are two different kinds of exercises in the book. The first is what we call a motivating exercise, and we have one at the beginning of every chapter. It shows the students what the material in that chapter can be used for. For example, we open the Taylor series chapter with a motivating exercise about a nucleus inside a crystal. The students derive the differential equation for a nucleus feeling Coulomb forces from its nearest neighbors. They can easily write down that equation, but there's a function in the middle of it that is so complicated that they cannot possibly solve that differential equation analytically. We then tell them, here's a much simpler function that's a good approximation to that one. And if you substitute it, then you can now solve the differential equation and find the frequency of oscillations for that nucleus. In this chapter, you're going to learn how to generate approximations like that. Within each chapter, most sections start with what we call a discovery exercise, which is more focused on a particular mathematical technique such as solving a differential equation by separating variables, or mapping one region of the complex plane onto a different region, or deriving Bessel functions by using the method of Frobenius. The students, in a guided process, can walk through the technique themselves before they are ever taught how to do it. There's a lot of research that shows that when students are actively engaged at the beginning of the learning process, they learn the material better, and they retain it much better than they could if they just heard an explanation. Even a really good explanation. Even our explanation. We do want to stress that as a professor, you pick and choose which 
exercises you're going to use. I think I'm going to use this one in class and I'll assign that one for homework and I'll ignore this one entirely. You could even use the entire book without ever looking at the exercises. But we hope you'll at least try them. So as an example, the first chapter that we wrote was on partial differential equations because it's used in so many branches of engineering. So we started by looking at how that was presented in a lot of textbooks, physics textbooks, engineering textbooks, math textbooks, and we ended up deciding that the clearest organization was very different from how we saw it in any of those books. Some books present every PDE as its own special case. So we're going to solve the wave equation. Okay, now forget the wave equation. We're going to solve the heat equation. Okay, now forget that. We're going to move on to Schrodinger's equation, and so on. Others present separation of variables as a unifying mathematical theme, but it's a random mathematical trick. Let's just suppose there were a solution of the form x of x times t of t for no obvious reason and see where that gets us. We emphasize that each PDE has a set of normal modes, very simple solutions that show possible behaviors of the system, and that you can build up more complicated behaviors as combinations of those normal modes. And then we talk about separation of variables as a mathematical technique for finding the normal modes of a physical system. By the way, we also emphasize normal modes in our chapter on linear algebra. We build the book so that these chapters are not dependent on each other in any way, but if you do teach both chapters, students should see a deep mathematical connection between coupled oscillators that they're solving with matrices and a waving string that they're solving with PDEs. In both cases, here are the normal modes, and here's how we use them to build up any arbitrary behavior. But getting back to PDEs, most books at that point say, okay, having done separation of variables in Cartesian coordinates, now let's do it in spherical and cylindrical coordinates. So we do the exact same thing. Yeah, we do the same thing, but we emphasize that the process is exactly the same. Every step of the technique looks identical until you've reduced your PDE to an ordinary differential equation, and then the solution to that ordinary differential equation is some other kind of function. So you get Legendre polynomials, you get Bessel functions, whatever. We tell them the essential things they need to know about those functions, but we also emphasize that if you get a function that you've never heard before, you can still work with that function to find solutions to a problem. Most students are really scared of doing that until they've had some practice with it. And then having finished separation of variables, we move on to the method of eigenfunction expansion using Fourier series to solve a PDE. And then we do the method of transforms, and we emphasize that it's essentially the same method. If it's a finite domain, you use a Fourier series. If it's an infinite domain, you use a Fourier transform. And once you've solved them with Fourier transforms, it's not a huge leap to then solve them with Laplace transforms. Again, we want students to see that they're not learning something brand new. It's not that different from solving with Fourier transforms. But we also want them to understand these are the circumstances that would lead Fourier transforms to be the right method, and these are the somewhat different circumstances that would lead you to try Laplace transforms. And more generally, we lay out here's how you know when to use separation of variables, when to use a Fourier series, when to use a transform. And the pattern of this chapter set the pattern for how we approached a lot of other topics. We looked at other textbooks, and we ended up presenting much the same material but often organized in a very different way that's useful for physicists and engineers who need to know how to apply the math. Go to www.felderbooks.com to find a complete table of contents, sample exercises, explanations, problem sets, and a whole lot more. Or email me at gfelder at smith.edu if you have any questions about the book. Or go to www.wiley.com slash felder to get a free, online, time-limited copy of the entire book. Order now and we'll throw in a set of steak knives. You can't say that. Well, I was just... We, we don't have any steak knives. Well, we could. I bet we could find there some. There are no cheap. steak knives. So how do we derive the form of the Bessel functions? Oh, well, we... we the Bessel!